Hello, and thank you for joining us this evening. We're so thankful that you have decided to be a part of our class. Now, we are a part of an ongoing series in which we are studying why I'm a member of the Church of Christ uh, by Leroy Brownlow. And a matter of fact, in his lesson when he discusses prayer, he actually discusses the mourner's bench. And so that's actually going to be our lesson this evening as we discuss Where's the mourner's bench? And, and maybe some uh, have come into an auditorium like ours and they have that question. Well, where is the mourner's bench? Or where is the altar? Maybe it is true that you've seen people, even at our services, that have come forward and maybe they kneel down in front of the Lord's table and they put their hand up upon it or something like that. Um, or where they're coming forward, and maybe they've even knelt down on the stairs there in the front, and they're paying what we would call an altar call. They're paying a visit to the altar, um, and it's similar to what would be considered the mourner's bench. And so I want us to talk a little bit about the mourner's bench as we move forward in our lesson tonight. The mourner's bench, by definition, uh, is also known as the mercy seat or anxious bench, as it has been called, especially the, the anxious bench um, in Methodist and other evangelical Christian churches. And usually it's a bench that's located toward the front. And that is, um, by definition, according to uh, Wikipedia, is the area where the, the clergy, that is the religious leader, uh, occupies during their worship periods. Um, and, and usually what happens is uh, the individuals, sometimes they'll sit on it, but often they will kneel in front of it and uh, at that bench. And the, the, the reason why they do this, uh, it could be a couple of different things, and especially depending on which religious group we're discussing. But most frequently, especially among Methodists, is that they go forward to this particular bench and they're, they're praying, they're crying, they're wailing. And, and it could be for a couple of different reasons. One, it could be to experience what they call the new birth or to be saved, to pray through. Secondly, it could be that they're there to receive sanctification. Maybe it is they're there to confess sins, forgiveness of sins. Um, and some believe that they want the second work of grace or to receive what's called entire sanctification, um, that maybe they have been there before and they're already Christians, but now they've come again and they need to pray again in order to receive that complete sanctification. Uh, some Methodist churches uh, have changed out uh, what is the mourner's bench, and they've replaced it with what's called chancel rails. Um, where Methodist as well as other evangelical Christians receive Holy Communion in addition to experiencing the new birth, repenting of their sins, and praying. And that's what this picture is representative of. Matter of fact, it's taken from a Methodist church, and this is one of their pictures from their website that is referenced there below. Um, and so these are the rails that are there, and that's where they have come forward, and they're, they're kneeling down there. Um, for different reasons. Like I said, it depends on what that need is. Some of them believe they're coming forward so that they can pray in order to reach salvation. Others are there for different reasons. And so this was a, these rails were featured in Roman Catholic, Anglican, Lutheran, and Methodist churches, and they are defined as barriers of various kinds, often mark off, they mark off a, a specially sacred area of the church that's close to the altar, which is usually reserved for those that are the religious leaders or the ordained clergy. And uh, what happened is, following the exposition of the doctrine of transubstantiation at one of the councils of the Catholic Church in 1215, the clergy were required to ensure that the blessed sacrament was to be kept protected from irreverent access and abuse, and so that's why they have that separation there so that they could keep what they consider to be uh, the body of Jesus there in the sacraments, the body and the blood. And so they needed to keep those uh, sacred elements separate, and so they had those rails that went up, and then they began to kind of merge that idea with uh, the altar call, the mourner's bench, and just kind of combine them all um, to 
present what we know today as these rails. And the use is common in Catholic places of worship, but with the new buildings being put up, they have left out these rails. Uh, with Lutheranism, an altar rail is um, the common place for the pastor to hear a confession, which generally is required to receive the Eucharist for the first time. That is, when they come up and receive the what we would call their Lord's Supper um, during their services. In uh, Methodist churches, the communicants receive Holy Communion at these rails, um, devoutly kneeling, and the rite of confirmation. Uh, is part of this, that's where they come forward for that, and that is the profession of faith of an adolescent who was baptized as an infant for fulfilling membership, uh, as well as the imposition of ashes on the head during Ash Wednesday, and that's where this takes place. They come forward, they kneel there um, before the rails, and that's where that is administered. So this gives us a little bit of an idea um, as to uh, the rail and kind of what happens here, and um, Often, they can also come forward for other reasons as well in the Methodist Church. But the mourner's bench, let's, let's get back to that a little bit. Um, and, and this is an older principle, but still we see um, what people are doing. Now they have replaced often the bench with other means, but they still are coming forward in the same way. It's just to a different place where they're kneeling down. And that's why sometimes even people that are not do not have a background in the churches of Christ or haven't had a whole lot of teaching uh, when they feel the need to come forward or what, for whatever reason, that's what they're doing and uh, because that's what they know. The mourner's bench at such gatherings, the mourner's bench was usually placed in the center of the congregation adjacent to the pulpit in plain view of everyone present. The bench might be several wooden planks uh, or wooden benches, um, a few chairs, or perhaps just an enclosed area without seats. Uh, people went to their mourner's bench when they considered themselves finally ready to abandon a life of sin and step unfaltering toward eternal salvation. And so intense praying, exhortations by the preacher and other previous converted Christians, crying, singing proclamations of guilt and shame by the convicted, and occasionally spiritual exercises such as jerks or speaking in tongues often accompanied this particular transformation. So this gives you a little bit of an idea of the background and I've got each of the websites I'm taking this information from uh, cited at the bottom of each one and so this information has come from the website that is mentioned here. Uh, out of the doctrine of original sin uh, came the tradition of the mourner's bench and the altar call and no one is certain when it really started. A lot of historians will say the Methodists are the ones that started this uh, one antidote of 1798 tells of a pastor, John Easter, issuing a call for his audience to gather around a bench in front of the chapel to pray for salvation. And some say that's where it came from. Another gentleman by the name of Charles, Charles Finney, who was a Presbyterian mis minister during the Second Great Awakening in the uh, America, uh, roped off the first few pews of seats in his meetings and called these the anxious seats. Sinners were urged to leave their seats in the back and move forward as the preacher railed against the evils of the day. And as an encore, Finney uh, finished, uh, then finished his sermons by preaching directly to those and sometimes only to those individuals that were in those first few rows, that they were in the anxious seats. Now, Wikipedia claims that this practice was instituted by John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist Church. And apparently the first documented appearance of the mourner's bench was in 1741 when the American minister Eleazar Wheelock started targeting sinners by having them sit in the front bench as he gave a fiery, anxiety-induced sermon, reminiscent of those of his contemporary Jonathan Edwards. So this gives us a little bit of a background of the mourner's bench. Now, I, I looked online as trying to do a little bit of research about the mourner's bench, and there was one gentleman that was asking, tell me a little bit about it, I'm unfamiliar with it. And on this particular thread, uh, there was a couple of people on this board that said, yeah, I know about it, let me tell you about my experiences of it. And Giselle writes this, and she says, I know exactly what the mourner's bench is. And she wrote this back in 14. Uh, we called it the moaning bench when I was growing up. 
I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, and when you turned 12 years old, you were expected to go down to the moaning bench. We referred to it as going down. We would ask each other, are you going down this year? This was expected of you if you wanted to join the church and be baptized. The preacher would approach us and motion us to kneel at the bench, then the deacons, deaconesses, and whoever else wanted to would gather around and sing songs while we repeated over and over, Oh, Lord, save my soul. Oh, Lord, save my soul. Uh, you repeated this until the Spirit hit you, and when you felt the Spirit, you jumped up and started shouting. That's when everyone knew you got it. When we went down to the moaning bench and felt the Spirit and got up and shouted, that's when you knew you got religion. Now, this is uh, this lady's background. I believe she's African-American. And this is her background of what she experienced in the United States in her congregation of the Southern Baptists. That does not necessarily mean that that's how all of them are, but this reflected her experience of the mourner's bench. Another individual said this, we sat that bench um, at that bench during a revival week because we wanted to join the church, and in a part of that we, um, was we had to be baptized and let everyone know who the candidates were for the church membership and baptism. Uh, that's just the way that was written, so it was a little hard to read because the person typing it didn't type it very well. But basically, what we know from that is if you wanted to join the church, then you went up and you were candidates. You were then indicating that you wanted to place membership and that you wanted to be baptized in this religious group. Uh, another one said it was just a separate bench located in the front or on the side for people that wanted to be saved or ready for baptism and they could get away from other people that were distracting them so that they could focus upon what they were doing so that was a couple of different individuals telling about their experiences about uh, the mourners bench and and I will also um, as we move through the lesson um, I would like to play a, a small clip of uh, a gentleman that will tell you a little bit about his experiences also with the mourners bench now nowhere has God required the alien unregenerate sinner to pray for the forgiveness of his sins. In fact, God has not commanded the alien sinner to pray for anything. Um, for what could the sinner pray for anyway? And that's the question that we ask. So let's ask a couple of these questions. Should that person who is lost, who is in sin, who's not saved, should that person pray for God to love him? Well, no. Uh, God has already done so. He loved the whole world, sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. And God has already commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we don't have to pray for God to love us. Should that person be praying for light, understanding? Well, no. The Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, Psalm 119, 105. The opening of the words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Psalm 119, 130. Should a sinner pray for the Holy Spirit? Well, no. Uh, he's already come upon the apostles to guide them into all truth, the apostles and prophets during the first century. And Christ promised the Holy Spirit to them in a miraculous measure, and they received it, and they taught the word, they confirmed the word, and they wrote down the word. And so we have that today. And if we want to know the truth, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3 that we need to read what those inspired authors already wrote down. And so that's what the Bible teaches us very clearly. The Holy Spirit is not given to us in any type of miraculous form. Uh, matter of fact, we simply need to obey the teachings of the Holy Spirit that we find in the Bible. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, should the sinner pray for Christ to come to him? Well, no. Matter of fact, the sinner is invited to come to Christ. And matter of fact, you look at the great invitation in Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30, we sing it too. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If the sinner fails to come, then he's not going to be saved. God's called him to come. John 5, 40 says, And you will not come to me that you might have life. You see, we have to come to him 
in order to receive that eternal life. We're not sitting around and praying for Christ to come to us. Well, that's, that's reversed. And so should that person then, the sinner, be praying for mercy? No, God's already shown. He's a merciful God. He's merciful toward man. As a matter of fact, in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which echoes the sentiment in John 3, 5, except a man be born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. We have to be born again. And so clearly, God has extended that mercy. We don't have to pray for it. He's given us an opportunity to respond by having the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which is being born again of the water and of the Spirit. Should he pray for God to become willing to save him? That seems kind of odd. No. Uh, the truth is, God is willing. Um, he doesn't want any to pray, perish. He doesn't want any to be lost. Matter of fact, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance. And so God doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants them to change their life and come to him. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 says, Who will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants them to be saved. And so we don't have to be uh, praying to God and trying to convince him to be willing to save us. He wants to save us. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel chapter 18 32 says, For I have no pleasure in the death of, the, of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. And that is the idea that you need to turn to God and come to him. He is ready to save you. And so God is anxious to save me. So should men pray for, for converting or saving power? The answer is no. We're not praying for that because the Bible says the gospel is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also unto the Greek according to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Should that person pray to get, quote, religion? Well, no. Uh, really, religion is something that you practice. As a matter of fact, in James chapter 1 and verse 27, he says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And so that's what we do in life and how we live in life. Um, that is described here as pure religion an undefiled religion. So should he pray for saving grace? No. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, Titus 2, 11 and 12. Should he pray for pardon? No, the sinner has to turn to God in order to be pardoned. That's part of the God's law of pardon. You have to be willing to turn to him, to come to him. In Isaiah 55, 6 and 7, it says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, and we will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God is ready to pardon. Nehemiah 9, 17 says, And he refused to obey neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a, a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. So the real question we're asking is, uh, we're not having to pray for pardon. We're asking, is the sinner ready to turn to God and obey his will to receive pardon? So that they might access the grace of God. So should the sinner pray for salvation? No. Um, according to Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized. That's what it teaches every one of you. Why? In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. In Acts 22 and 16, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Should he pray for faith? Well, no. Because, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Should he pray for repentance? Well, no, 
Uh, repentance is a command of God for men to obey. It's something that we have to respond to and obey. And so he commands all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17.30. At the times of this ignorance, God overlooked, he winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he's appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man in whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So the Bible teaches that he commands all men everywhere to repent. There's a judgment day coming, and so he's calling us to change our ways. So we don't sit and pray for repentance. This is something that we respond to. We repent. We turn. Should he pray for a pure heart? Well, no. The heart is made pure by obedience to the truth, according to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. He said, what? Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. Obeying the truth. And so clearly, he shouldn't be praying for that. Should he pray for, the, uh, for freedom from sins? No. Why? Read Romans 6, 17 and 18. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which is delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. What did they do? They obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered to them. And they changed their way. So we can have freedom from our sins if we were willing to obey the teaching, that doctrine that is delivered, the gospel of of Jesus Christ. Should he pray to ex uh, pray for God to, to accept him? Well, no. God's not a respecter of persons. The Bible says in Acts 10 and verse 35, but in every generation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. So we don't have to pray to God for God to accept us. He's provided for us his teachings so that we may be able to work Righteousness, to choose to do what is right according to what he says, according to his standards and his will. Should he pray for the Lord to make known his will to him? No. The Lord, Lord has already done that. He revealed it to his apostles. They recorded it in the word of God. And we may read and understand it so that we can know the will of God and the mind of God, according to Ephesians 3, 3 through 5. Should he pray for remission of sins? Well, the answer is no. What happened in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38? On the day of Pentecost, they said, uh, what do we do? What shall we do? And he told them what to do. He didn't say that they needed to pray for the remission of sins. He told them to repent. That means to change their ways, change their, their mind and their heart and their actions to repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So he didn't say pray for the remission of sins. That's not there. And so he taught them what to do. Should the person then pray, that is the sinner, uh, for the baptism of fire? Well, the answer to that is absolutely not. You don't want to pray for that. The baptism of fire? No. Uh-uh. Uh, that's going to come according to 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You do not want that. You don't want that baptism of fire. That is what's going to come in the day of judgment ultimately. Why should the sinner pray at all? I mean, where does the Bible teach an alien sinner to pray it out with the Lord or to stay on your knees in prayer until God saves you? The answer is it doesn't teach that. The sinner must hear the gospel, believe it, repent of sins, and be baptized in order to have the remission of sins. And so that's the Lord's way. We don't need to change that. And so to teach the mourner's bench system of religion, instead of what the Bible actually teaches, is to lead souls astray. And that is not what we want to do. When we come back together again, we're going to study praying through. We're going to continue talking about the mourner's bench. We're going to talk about what it means to pray through. 
and uh, that false teaching, that wrong belief. We're also going to talk a little bit about the, the second work that they say you receive at the mourner's bench. The first one, they say, is that you go to the mourner's bench and you pray so hard and fervently that you can pray through to God and receive salvation. That's the first. And then the second one, also, they say, is that you have to go there and pray for sanctification to remove original sin. So those are two factors that are a part of what would be considered the mourner's bench. We're going to continue to study this, and I hope that you will stay with this because it's good for us to understand uh, where our religious uh, friends are coming from, maybe what they've taught and what they have grown up in so that we have a better understanding of what we see today. I mean, the, really, the idea of the sinner's prayer has evolved out of some of these practices that come from these other religious groups. And so it's good for us to understand a little bit of where it comes from. So I hope that you will join us again in our second part of this series as we continue to study um, what is called the mourner's bench. Where is the mourner's bench? And then as we begin to talk about praying through. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you have a wonderful week.